obsessed with food. I am a weekend chef, and when I travel, visiting the local food market is always on the top of my list. When I'm in Beijing, I must check out the lychees in the Donghuamen Night Market. When in Seattle, the morel mushrooms in the Pike Market, and when in Palermo, the kioja beets in the Balora. But I'm not alone. Food is amongst the most photographed subjects on the internet, and there are four billion recipes floating around. And at the end of this, I will hit you with yet one more. I realize I'm very fortunate to have access to this plenty and variety that lets me even play with food. But food is not an entertaining amusement. When I'm hungry, I'm a crabby mother, a snappy daughter, an impatient scientist. I'm not myself when I'm hungry, even momentarily. Yet I'm painfully aware. That many around the world struggle to meet their daily basic caloric needs. Fifteen percent of the world goes hungry every day, and a lot of them systematically. And three million children die every year out of insufficient food, and two billion are in a downward spiral of malnutrition. In the last two hundred years. Our population has grown by a factor of seven, and the current seven billion is projected to be ten by 2050. And in the last century alone, we lost 75 percent of genetic diversity in our essential food crops. And in my lifetime alone, the biodiversity in the tropics has declined by 60 percent. Today. Most of the calories of the world's population comes from 12 plant species, like corn, rice, sorghum, and such, and a few animal species. So the worry about safe and sustained food supply to feed the current and future planet is real. But there is a danger even more immediate. For instance, earlier this year in Bangladesh, the wheat crop. Was attacked by a fungal infection, threatening to wipe it out from the entire subcontinent. An avocado, a divine delight of a fruit, is under threat from a fungal infection. Laurel wilt right here in the U.S. And I cannot imagine a world without chocolate. And did you know that chocolate grows on trees? Witches' broom, a fungal infection, slashed production of cacao by 80 percent in Brazil a few decades ago. So these incursions not just endangered our favorite food crops, but they also pushed small farmers out of the farmland into city shanty towns. Today we are one global village. A scourge in one corner rapidly spreads to the others. And the plunging biodiversity puts at risk the food supply not just of vulnerable countries, but also those that are rolling in plenty now. What do we do? We are unhappy with chemicals, whether in fertilizers or in pesticides. We are even more wary of GMOs or genetically modified organisms, although there is no scientific evidence yet. We fear what unintended consequences GMOs may bring. Can we get around this? I think we can. As you know, agriculture is an evolutionary masterstroke of the last ten thousand years, and plants have been around for millions of years. And nature. Continues to carry her experiments, and we see the results all around us. She's talking to us through her variety and the array of flora. We must sit up and listen. My silver bullet is to ferret out and use this diversity that already exists within the DNA of the plant populations. 
We don't have to manipulate the plants with exogenous or external elements, but we unlock the secrets that already exist within the plants. An organic approach to an organic problem. How can we achieve this? Genome and mathematics. So fortunately, we are in the throes of a genomic revolution. The cost of DNA sequencing has come down a millionfold. Its power has gone up a thousandfold. What does this entail? Anything around us with an iota of life in it can be and is being sequenced. But we must make sense. Of this deluge of DNA big data, the usual suspects, like machine learning and AI, don't quite make the cut. People often ask me, "How complex can the genome of a simple plant be?" And I say, "Very complex." <laughs> More complex than that of us humans. For instance, we have two copies of a chromosome. A plant can have as many as 22. A humble potato has four copies. So math to the rescue, but not any kind of math will do. In my earlier life, I worked with continuous mathematics, the kind that deals with doubly curved surfaces such as aircraft wings. But then I had a chance encounter with the genome, the genome with its long strand of just four letters T, C, G, A, is a Willy Wonka chocolate factory of puzzles. The questions we ask of this discrete, not continuous, discrete T, C, G, A abstraction of DNA, is like solving complex puzzles. So I turn to discrete math, which is a Grown-up version of puzzle solving. So I'll use the metaphor of a Sudoku puzzle, because I believe many of you are already familiar with it, to solve an important problem of untangling the chromosomes of multiple copies of nearly identical ones. The nearly identical copies mash up the chromosome, but for a bag of cryptic clues. Why the puzzle? Sudoku, like most puzzles, has its set of fixed rules, but so does my problem with its immutable constraints. Furthermore, I can shoehorn this bag of clues into an instance of Sudoku and piggyback right on the solution. But the Sudoku has integers, but these are only placeholders. I simply replace them with DNA letters, and I have. Simultaneously untangled the chromosomes of a population of a species. But Sudoku is only a metaphor for the problem. In real life, the sizes are bigger, the dimensions are higher, the number and complexity of the constraints are higher, and there are many more such maddeningly hard problems. But it is this mosaic of problem solvers or algorithms that crack open the door of our understanding of the relation between the. Interior, which we cannot see, the DNA, with the exterior, which we can see, like the color of a pot, or even stress resistance. We did this for the cacao crop. We ground up the plant material, extracted its DNA, and made sense of it through a suite of puzzle solvers. And this opened the door for breeding, fungus resistance, and good, if not better tasting, crop. But these puzzle solvers are agnostic to the species or to the characteristics. What works for cacao works for avocado, potato, or even grass, the progenitor of all domesticated grains. It's fascinating to me that we can connect the dots from diversity to action through the double helix. DNA big data and mathematics works. We hope that in the coming years. Mathematics, as our new fertilizer, if you will, will preserve diversity. We'll have robust crops. We'll have better crops. So smaller plots of land can be used, reducing the stress on the environment. We'll have sustainable agriculture, happy small farmers, and better 
and more food for all. So no parent has to ever worry about how to feed her children. And now, from a mom who has worked with the DNA of scourged, ravaged crops like cacao and avocado, here's a recipe that I promised you earlier. Take a 100-gram bar of your favorite dark chocolate, melt it, and fold in the pulp of two avocados, and voila! Full of antioxidants, unsaturated fats, and even delicious treat for you. Thank you.